Well, I'm Tom Bowen. I'm the athletic director at University of Memphis. I've been there since 2012. Before that, I was at San Jose State University, where I was the athletic director for nine years. Before that, I was in the NFL. I worked for the San Francisco 49ers. And before that, I was at Cal. And then my claim to fame is I started at De La Salle High School. I was the athletic director there at De La Salle and spent almost 11 years there. And then I was at St. Mary's College. So I've been in athletic administration since 1986 or 87 and have found it to be kind of a life a life choice and, and a career that I've enjoyed every day, wake up every day and just feel like the luckiest man alive to be working in athletics and working with students and, and being part of a, a, the college NFL or the high school arena has always been where I've wanted to be. So it's been good. It's great. Uh, in your field, you know, you just said so many positive things and you wake up every day feeling lucky. And there's so many challenges, not only in your field, but just in business. I mean, it just, it just, it just the stakes keep going up, it seems like. How do you maintain that positive approach and how does that positive leadership infect the rest of your group? So I guess, I mean, the key for me is we have a couple of basic principles. One is that I'm the most unimportant person by myself. And so the idea is to, to, to hire as much talent as humanly possible to come work in a collaboration, in a, in a, in a focused team. Um, and in our business, it's the team approach that makes you very, very successful. So. Um, Throughout my career, it's always been about finding people that were extraordinary in what they did and then recruiting them and bringing them to wherever I was, whether that was in, in, a, in a high school situation, in the NFL, and Division I, wherever, wherever it could be. And secondly, was, was, was creating a communication strategy that, that talked about, it's, a, it's about your work, not about your job. So everybody has a job description, but, but we, what we talk about is our work because our work is a re reflection of us and, and who we are and how we are as human beings. And I'm about being a human being, not human doing. Humans tend to get caught up in what they do as opposed to who they are and how they be. And so we've created an environment where it's a culture of trust, it's a culture of engagement, it's a culture of what we do in our work. And we talk about our work. And we don't talk about job titles or job descriptions. And we all have a title, and it's designed that way in our business. But we create an environment where everybody has an ability to work towards the commonality of what we're trying to do. Um, and it's been very, very successful wherever I've been by empowering people to lead. Like I don't, I don't hire you to manage. I don't care that you can manage. I don't need managers. 7-Eleven or no offense, but, but there, are, there are management programs for people that want to manage. In college athletics and, and in what we do, it's about leadership. It's about come here and lead. Come here and make a decision. Come here and take a chance. We're going to make mistakes? Sure. Um, collectively, they haven't been you know, detrimental to the, or disastrous to the institutions I've worked for, but but people like to work in an environment where we talk about our work, talk about our focus, talk about our ability to lead, and talk about empowerment. So we empower people to do and to be. And so by creating that, whether you're 25 or 55, when you work in my environment, uh, department, whatever you want to call it, um, we share excitement. We suffer the same disappointment. We collectively look to betterment. And how do we do that? And so it translates into how we treat our student athletes, how we treat our coaches, how we hire. And, and there are people that don't, that don't stay with that and they move on. And so then we have a turnaround opportunity to put more people in that. So as you, as you build it from two employees to four employees to 15 employees to 40 employees, you get to 85 or 90 people in an apartment like I have now, you have an, a culture, you have a complete culture change that takes place at, at the University of Memphis. And the byproduct of that is champions and winning and what we do. So that person, what, you know, who's one of the newer ones feels as much of a stake in it than you. Correct. Do. Correct. And mm -hmm. Correct. And, and, and empowering people to lead, like challenging them to lead. Like a couple things. In my department, you don't get to complain by email. You don't get to confront somebody by email. In fact, if I catch you doing it, you get reprimanded or we have a come to Jesus moment or you're done. We communicate in our society the greatest detriment to trust is that we don't communicate one-on-one. -on -one. We don't look at another human being and tell them how we feel. We don't look at another human being and say that we're upset or that this bothered me. We tend to send an email or we send a text or we tell a friend or we create a, you know, a, a toxicity that happens in human behavior that's inappropriate. If you want to change a culture, make people communicate to each other. The people that can't communicate with each other, you don't want them in your building anyway. One of the greatest fallacies that we make about talent is we say, because of your degree or how smart you are or how good you write or how, how profoundly you can say this, that doesn't translate that you're a good human being to work with. What translates is people, the ability for them to work 
it collectively as two human beings, that changes the culture, that creates the environment, that creates the catalyst to be, to be great, to be phenomenal, to be, you know, there's a saying in my, in, my, in my office, and I stole it from John Maxwell, and I've used it forever, and it said, nothing's impossible, impossible's temporary, impossible's not a fact, it's an opinion. And, and so if we start with the premise that, that we're, we're going to do that. We also start with the premise that we can't teach talent. You know, you, you, you're given your God-given talent, your God-given talent. So we're not going to make you more talented. So we can't teach you to be more talented. So we're going to create an environment where you're going to become this catalyst piece to this cog to what we do. Um, some of it's stuff that when I was, when I was younger, I, I knew when I was at San Jose, I knew Jim Collins and, and read some of his stuff about Built to Last and some of his stuff about Good to Great, and you kind of take some of that premise, and then you take some of the ideas that you, you learn from guys like Maxwell and, and some other guys, and you just start to kind of mold it into, into people, and then you enforce it in the way they behave. And, and that's what we've been able to do, and it's worked. It's worked really, really well. This is fantastic. Um, I wanted to go, jump back to uh, the human being. Mm -hmm. I mean, you have to have goals, so doing, accomplishing, mm -hmm. but, but how does, how does being a, a human being in your department translate into results? Okay, so if I focus on the culture, if I have a culture of pretenders, the byproduct's losing. If I have a culture of champions, the byproduct's winning. So you create a culture, a championship culture is designed by self-reliance, self-motivation, self-acceptance, okay, and what's considered true accountability, okay? Not perception, not premise of how I feel about you, how you look or how you stand or how you dress or how you talk. So pure accountability is about your work. And so if, if I ask you to tell me about your work as opposed to what's your job, see people go to a job, people travel to a job, I have a job, but my work, we never say, we never say look at this artist's job, we say look at the artist's work, look at the sculptures, Look at the work of this artist. Look at the work of this designer. Look at the work, because the creativity in your work is you. Your, your being is part of your work. Your task is to go to your job. So the first thing you do is you take out the dynamic that you have a job. You have a responsibility to work in my department. How are you gonna work? And how is your work gonna make a difference? And so we make you put your being into your work. We make you take personal and community and professional pride in what you do. And, and it translates from, you know, being the best at everything you do in your work capacity, whether you're uh, facilities, compliance, business, uh, strength and conditioning, training, um, you're in charge of travel, you're in charge of, of, of books, you're in charge of bursar's office, you're in charge of housing, but, but, but we, we don't, we don't, we don't, we don't, we just say, this is your work. How are you going to be the best at your work? And, and we spend a lot of time celebrating when we work well together. We do a lot of, um, in, my, in my office, we talk about family first. So my deputy athletic director, Mark Allnett, who I hired from, who's the sitting AD at SEMO, stepped down as an AD, came to be my number two. Because um, his quality of life has been affected. He had four kids, right? So we're like, in other things, he, he wanted to, to have just a balance. So in my, my office, your family matters. If you have sons playing a softball game or a baseball game or swim meet or whatever, you need to go do that. And we embrace that, we let that happen. And then what happens is people then go above and beyond. And I never have to worry about people being there um, on time or putting all the effort in. And, 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 and I don't know, and I'm unique, I'm very different than most Division I athletic directors. It's very different the way, the way I lead. Um, and I think, it's why we'll continue to be very successful, wh whatever we do. Um, most of the people that work for me um, get picked off. Like, uh, 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 and, and, I, and I like that. So, they, so then I have a whole other opportunity to bring somebody new and, 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 and bring them into our, into our environment. So that's a long answer. So I've no, that's great. I, I, I would have then guess that um, that in your department, that the, the style and the way that and, and the and focusing on the work and the human being is very empowering. And if it's not, then they're probably gone. But Correct. I mean, but it's probably very empowering to people who buy in. Mm -hmm. And then we turn them loose, and then they get picked off. <laughs> so, so my deputy director is now the deputy at Missouri. I mean, I've, I went through at San Jose State. I lost all four sets of my senior team. 
I lost all my senior team at Memphis, having to rebuild a senior team at Memphis, which is fine. So we have new guys, new people, new men and women come in, and, and, then, and then you just create this, this uh, it's, a, it's a pond effect, right? When you throw a rock in a pond, create a rippled dynamic. To me, that's, I see that as, as, as my, um, when I was a young assistant AD, associate AD, I worked for a guy named John Kasser, who was the idiot cow, who had an empowering presence of positive energy in everything he did. I thought it was the most fascinating thing. And I had a chance to, to meet some people in this business that were critical in, in the way they led. Seth Dempsey at the time when he was at Arizona and then became the NC. Uh, Moose Kraus, when I was at Notre Dame, he was the athletic director. And um, you know, there, was, there was these people, Homer Rice and, and, um, and, and guys here today, Kevin White, some other guys who were just, they're just icons in our business about how they empowered people to, to move forward. And I think we, myself and my colleagues, if you, we have a duty to this next generation. To, to create that leadership piece in our business. Because <clears throat> if all we do is manage college athletics for higher ed, we're gonna get, we're, we're, gonna, lose the, we're gonna lose the fight. We're gonna, we're gonna have a hard time. Uh, talking about change, um, you know, people have different levels of readiness and willingness to adopt change. How do you ensure that the pace of change is appropriate for your team and your organization? So, <clears throat> um, change, is, change is truly, opportunity, right? And so, 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 so to me, in all moments of chaos, there's opportunity. Um, and so we know that change is unavoidable. Uh, it, it's expected. Um, we anticipate in the change to find the moment of opportunity. So uh, change in coaching, changes in scheduling, changes in um, conference time. I mean, w w in our world, when change happens, there's opportunity hidden in it. And then there's there's chaos and there's angst and there's, there's concern, but there's always opportunity. And so try to create an environment where we say, okay, if the change happens, you know, how, how are we gonna take advantage of the change? Like, what are we, how are we gonna position, you know, our program or our student athletes <coughs> or, or the university athletic in general in the change? And by doing that, <coughs> we, don't, we don't get surprised, right? The, the, the thing you don't want to happen in change is be surprised. And when change happens, if you're prepared and you embrace it and you see that there's up, you try to find the opportunity in it, then you're never gonna get, change isn't gonna set you back. It might re-divert you and you may take a left instead of a right or you may have to, but you're not gonna be, you're not gonna be stalled. My, my, my humble opinion, but that's just my opinion. Um, do you like resistance <coughs> to change? Is that a good thing? Or, you know, obviously people have to get on board, but how do you, you know, what advice in uh, overcoming resistance and in, in ensuring that change is successful? Well, if you're resistant to change in our business, you're gonna you're you're gonna you're gonna you're gonna you're gonna get you're gonna get behind because it's coming. I mean, there's no way to avoid all the change that's getting ready to take place, and it's been coming for decades, and it and it comes in waves. And so I think um, being prepared for changes is being very very flexible and fluid in in how to in how to in how to see it. And what, so, so, for example, is it going to be national change? Is it going to be <coughs> um, overwhelmingly redirected change on a, on, a, on, a, on a national level, legal level? Is it coming from the courts? Is it coming from court of public opinion? Is it coming from the conference? Is it coming from the governing bodies? We don't know, right? But it's coming. And so I think you have to embrace all that and just say, we're not going to resist. We're going to be fluid and we're going to be adaptive. And then, and then when it happens, we're going to take advantage of it, and we're going to get in front. Somebody's going to be in front of the change, and there'll be a, the majority under it or behind it, but somebody's going to be in front of it. In any business, in any industry, since the beginning of time, someone's been in front of change. And because they're in front, they're the best. So the idea is to get in front of it. Not, the majority of people will be behind it or, or in it. And, and my position is, how do we get in front of it? So my staff and I spend a lot of time kind of trying to design nuances and scenarios that, that are uniquely different than what would be the standard quo and or standard, you know, kind of response, right? So, you know, so what if all of a sudden student athletes were no longer X? How would we re readdress that? What would we do, you know? All of a sudden we regionalize Olympic sports or, or now college football is gonna be played. And, I mean, so we try to, we, me and my senior team, try to think if the change is coming, Where's the, how do we get in front? You know, if, if legislation changes and we have to adopt some of this legislation, what, what, what do we do? 
Um, how do the best teams and organizations maximize personal influence and team motivation? I mean, as far as athletically, or um, I guess it's a leader, more of a leadership question, but it doesn't have to be. You know, but but team is obviously very important. In your world. Yeah. So I, you know, um, I think having people be consumed with the greater good, you know, not individual stature, hard, in a, in a very ambitious business. People want to be, you know, the assistant AD complains about the associate AD, the associate AD complains about the senior associate AD, the senior associate AD complains about the deputy AD, and the deputy AD complains about the AD. But in that entire tree, they bitch about the AD all day, right? So, so we already have a tree of, of succession or a ladder of power, so, so to me, it's about getting that entity of, lead, of leadership to really not be focused individually in key points and in key decisions and to be kind of collectively focused on being very, very good in everything. And that's a challenge because a lot of guys are senior associates want to be an AD. So they spend as, as much time thinking about how to become an athletic director as they do about being a senior associate AD in, in the current dynamic that they're in. It's, an, it's a human, natural human behavior. So it's my job as athletic director to keep pulling guys into the, hey, just do your job, it'll happen. You know, trust me, you're going to be an AD, but don't focus on it right now. Focus on doing these really, really well so people understand that you're part of that change. Focus on the work. Right, focus on the work. Um, last question, uh, what's the importance of, uh, of being responsible and accountable to those around you, and how do you ensure it happens in, on your team? Accountability. Well, I think um, accountability is a, is a, is a, is a, is a, is a kind of a dangerous dynamic in that it can be seen as punitive, but really what it's about is um, it's about instilling, in my opinion, a sense of pride in that all that we do to collectively, you're a piece of that, okay? And so one of the ways to create personal accountability is to have great success and you not, get any, not, not have any part of it. And so in a room of five people, if four people and I did something extraordinary and you did not, the personal accountability is obvious when we say, well, hey, John, why, why wouldn't you, why wouldn't you, you know? So, so there's an accountability dynamic that happens naturally when you create an environment of trust and everybody's focused on, this, on a goal. The other accountability that happens, in my opinion, is, is to say to people, look, you cannot. So, i say this right. So you cannot, you cannot stay status quo. So if, if I'm going to make you accountable, I have to make you not stay status quo. I have to get you to see that accountability is really about a, is, is a, is a finish line, right? So, so we start and we stop. I mean, personal accountability is that I've, I've accomplished this, this linear task, goal, moment, season. What, what, so, so the accountability is it's linear. It's not, so I can't get you to, if I'm going to make you accountable, I can't have you be status quo. I can't have you get halfway down the, down, down the line and go, shit, man, I'm good today. We're good. And, and so by focusing on your work and, and, your, and your efforts and your creativity and your leadership, you naturally have to get through the linear process. You've got, you cannot not be accountable because then otherwise you're not being you. And then we expose you as a pretender or a we're a guy that's not a really good man. You know, you know the valor, courage, integrity, character, those are, those are qualities that every human being wants to have said about them. Nobody wants to say that you have no character, no integrity, you're, you're chicken shit, you got no, nobody wants to say that about you. I don't know who, who you are, what business you're in, doesn't matter. So the natural feelings for being successful are innate, and they're in our, they're in our, they're in our DNA, and so we just, Accountability happens by me making the environment to where you want to succeed. Or, or, or you don't, you leave. I've never fired, I, I, I can tell you I've fired maybe three people and I've been sitting at E 14 years. I've maybe, I've maybe fired three people. I've had numerous, hundreds of come to Jesus moments where me and the other human being have sat down and said, male or female, this just isn't a good thing for you and I. How do you feel about that? You're absolutely right. Okay, good. People, people quit people. And people work for people. It's a people business in anything you do, including accounting.